I know is uh, a bit confusing to a lot of people because we seem to understand so little about it. Uh, today I want to speak about the home of righteousness. The home of righteousness. And uh, the scripture says that the home of righteousness is in the new heaven and the new earth. And of course I know the new heaven and the new earth is uh, somehow giving us challenges. You know, what is this new heaven and new earth? What happens to the old one? Okay, this is what we want to start <clears throat> discussing because we won't finish uh, that subject all by itself today because it's very, very white. But let me start reading uh, scriptures from the book of Isaiah 33, verse 5. The Bible says here, The Lord is exalted, for he dwells on high. He will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. Now, Zion is uh, the word that God uses to describe the people of God. You know, Zion at one time it was in Israel, but now, of course, Zion is uh, the family of God. You know, they're those who have received Christ as their Savior and Lord, and those who belong to the family of God. <clears throat> Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. I'll later on read a little bit more of that passage. The Bible says here, but in keeping with his promise, we are looking forward to new heaven and the new earth, the home of righteousness. We are looking forward to the new heaven and the new earth, the home of righteousness. And Ephesians chapter 3 verse 16, this is a prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians and of course for the church in general, that means for us too. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the saints to grasp how white and long and high and deep is the love of Christ. And to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with the measure of all the fullness of God. Imagine, the measure of all the fullness of God. Who would know that measure? Okay, verse 20. Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power, that is at work within us. To him be the glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Now this is a, a powerful uh, introduction of a, of a teaching. You know, God is talking about God who is able to do immeasurably more than we can ask or imagine. You know, even if you ask a lot from the Lord, you can never ask enough. Okay, the Bible says, you know, you don't have because you don't ask. And I think somehow, often we ask for things that are so tiny and so selfish, but we are not really asking the things that really God desires to do in this world and in our lives. So God is able to do <clears throat> much more than we can ask and that we can imagine. Imagine. Okay. Now we know that our world is able to imagine a lot of things. Okay, you can see this in some of the movies, some of the science fiction movies, some of the stuff that is being produced all the time to attract people. Yes, there's a lot of imagination there. But uh, the real stuff that we are going to see God will do that we cannot, not even closely, come to imagine. So this is what I want to talk about today, and I hope you are all ready. Please take a pen, take some paper, because uh, you can't possibly all keep it in your, in your mind uh, that I'm going to share with you. So let us pray as we start. Lord our God, we want to thank you so much for your wonderful presence. 
Thank you, Lord, that we are coming together as your family. And we are coming together with one purpose, Lord, to hear your word, to hear your voice, to hear your plans, to understand in a greater way that which you are going to unfold as we are following your footsteps. Lord Jesus, I pray, may you give us the ability to understand, the ability to grasp that which is being presented to us today from your word. I thank you, Lord, for your presence, and I thank you, Lord, for this powerful word that you have given to us so that we can be able to go deeper in our understanding of you and your plans. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Lord. Amen. So I want to take these uh, moments to talk about the new heavens and the new earth and the home of righteousness and so many other things that are uh, attached to this very subject. Now, in the book of um, 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 27, we read a very interesting scripture, which actually is being repeated not one time, not two times, but several times, I think four times. Okay, and uh, when God says something more than once, then he needs to say that so that we can capture it, so that we can understand it. And the Bible says here, you know, this is Solomon speaking. Solomon who has just finished the temple, the new temple that God had put on the heart of David, his father, to build. And, uh, you know, as, as this uh, um, temple is being finished, uh, there was a very, very powerful revelation that Solomon got. I mean, he was immersed in building this temple. This was, this was the one thing that he was, you know, putting as the grand kind of uh, project uh, in, in his early reign. And then as it's finished, there comes this very powerful understanding, this powerful revelation that God gave him. And he says, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Imagine, this is, a, this is an amazing word. Okay, Solomon, you know, was busy putting all the uh, required materials together, you know, organizing all the people who were building you know, it was a major, major operation. You can read that from uh, First Kings in the early chapters. And then finally everything is done. And of course the glory of the Lord comes down. But also Solomon has a revelation that God cannot live on earth. Even so, he may be with us here, but he cannot have a permanent home on this earth. Okay? because he is far, far greater than we can imagine. He doesn't even only live in heaven. In fact, the Bible says the highest heaven, which means there must be several, isn't it? Uh, Paul talks about the third heaven to which he went at one time. Okay? So uh, definitely there are different layers of heaven. There is maybe the first heaven which we can uh, imagine as the sky, then there is a second heaven which is not described but which probably we can understand as the uh, spiritual sphere where the, the spirit world is living, you know, where uh, you know, the, the demons operate and where the angels operate, you know. And of course then there is the third heaven and, and, you know, whatever has been seen in the third heaven, people have no, no ability, they are not permitted to speak about it. So in reality, we know, we know very little about, about heaven. Now, uh, every now and then you see a new book coming out, somebody claiming he has been in heaven and is describing what he has seen in heaven. Uh, now, first of all, be very skeptical about that, okay? Because such books are not gospel, okay? And there could be a lot of things that may mislead you. And I've seen that actually happening, that people believed in certain things that were very different from Scripture, from the Word of God. So when you hear such kind of stories, 
you must understand two things. Number one, we haven't got the capacity to really understand what is in heaven. Even if you go there today, you know, it will be so overwhelming that you will not be able to describe. And it's only John, the apostle, who was able to, to uh, give us a certain insight into the heavens because God so t told him to write it down. But for instance, Daniel, who had a lot of insight as well, was told that he should not say it to anybody. He must actually seal that, that information that he got and that he, uh, that he uh, could not uh, relate to anybody because the time was not ready for that. The time was not ripe. So we must understand, you know, even if somebody is claiming to have been to heaven, uh, <clears throat> first of all, as I said, be skeptical about it. And second, you know, uh, you must understand, even if it should be true that what I have seen uh, and what I have described would be reality, it is just the very heaven that will pass away. Okay? So in other words, there will be a heaven, a new heaven, or new heavens and a new earth. And that one nobody has seen except Christ himself. Okay? So we must recognize that. We, uh, we uh, you know, studying the scriptures, we are studying the word of God, and we need to uh, open up our minds to the reality of God. Now, um, <clears throat> When the Bible says even the highest heaven cannot create, cannot contain him, that means it tells us that God doesn't need creation. Okay? Because God is not created. Anything that is created needs also, uh, you know, a, a, a domain that is also created. So we who are created, we needed to have been put into a creation, okay, in which we can operate. But God is uncreated. He is eternal. He has always been and he will ever be. Okay? That means he is not dependent on his creation. Okay? He, he lives whether the creation is there or it's not there. You know? At one time, maybe you have, you have decided to build a house. But you, you were there before the house was built. And even if the house is finished and you move in, you are greater than the house. Isn't it? So we must understand that God has been before anything that we can, you know, uh, call creation or anything that exists in one way or the other because God is everlasting. He is from, from age to age. He is forever. Okay? So he created long before the heavens and the earth were created. In the Bible, <clears throat> we read so much about before the foundation of the earth or before the world began. And the Bible tells us in the book of Ephesians that God loved us, that God uh, designed us. You know, I say it in my own words. <clears throat> Be long before the world began. So that means before the world began, that means before earth was there, what was there? We don't know. But God was there. Okay, God was there and God existed and God was able to work without a heaven and without an earth because the heaven was created, the earth was created. Okay, <clears throat> please follow me. You know, don't get, get confused because we have all so many things that we have already constructed in our, in our mind that often are not uh, living up to the reality of the word of God. So the purpose of God's creation the one we live in, the one we know, is mankind. Okay? God brought us into this creation that he tailor-made for us human beings. Okay? Whatever was there before, don't worry. You know, whatever is out there in the universe, don't worry. Everything is culminating to the creation of God. The man and a woman that God created in his own image, in his own likeness. That is the reason for creation. Okay? And God desires that one day we will join him in our new home, which God calls the home of righteousness. I've been reading in Second Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Okay? We are looking forward to a new heaven 
and a new earth, the home of righteousness. Okay? And as we have seen in Isaiah chapter 33 verse 5, the Lord is exalted for he dwells on high and he will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. So the people of God are the people who are destined to live in the justice and the righteousness of God, in the home of righteousness. And of course we know that the origin of righteousness is God himself. So where God is, there will be righteousness. So creation is the structure that God uh, prepared, that God created in order to pursue his eternal plans. Okay? Not, not the other way around that we think we are planning for all kinds of different things and we come up with all kinds of amazing stuff. That's fine and good, but it's not enough. So God does not depend on creation as you and I, as mankind, has to, okay? We, we can't operate. If, if, if creation is not there, then we can't operate, okay? Because we are put into this creation by God himself. When he created us, he took some resource from the ground of this earth, and he formed us from the resource of the earth, and that's explaining why, you know, we will eventually going back to that, to that earth again. But of course, that is only one part of a, of a human being. The other part of the human being is that we were created by the breath of God. Okay? God was blowing his breath into our, into our life. You know, the Bible says when Adam had, formed, had been formed, then God blew into his nostrils the life blow, you know, the spirit that comes from the Lord. And that's how the human being came, you know, a living soul, a living creature. Okay, so we are made of this earth and we are made of God. But when we are finally done with whatever has to happen in this world, then whatever comes from this creation has to go back to the creation. And by that time, something new must have been built, okay? Something new must have come into being. And that is our spiritual life, our spiritual dimension. So God does not depend on creation. But he uses creation, okay? He uses creation, but he does not depend on it, okay? You and I, we cannot live without creation. If creation disappears, we disappear. But that's not true with God. God is not dependent on creation because he has created it, okay? Tomorrow he can create something new if he wants to. Now, in Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1, we read a very interesting uh, scripture. And it says, this is what the Lord says, okay? Isaiah chapter 66, verse 1. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where will my resting place be? Has not my hand made all these things? And so they came into being, declares the Lord. These are the ones I look on with favor, those who are humble and contrite in spirit and who tremble at my word. So in other words, God is the one who created all things, okay? But then he doesn't need it, okay? Even so, you know, he says heaven is his throne and earth is his footstool because that's how he has designated it, but he doesn't need it. Okay, let me understand, let me try to explain this. You know, if, if, if you become a big business person, okay, and you need, a, you need an office building, and you need a factory to create certain things that you have invented, you know, then you may be building a big factory, okay? And you designate one place for yourself that you use as an office, okay? That means you build something, you know, just like you build a house, you build a factory, you build an office, you build a, 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 an assembly plant or whatever it is, you know? 
And that's exactly what God did. God created these, these worlds, okay, this uh, earth as much as he created heaven, and he designated heaven to be his, his throne, okay? That means the throne is a place of administration, a, a place of rulership, a place of where you act from in order to direct the affairs of the whole company, okay? Now, before you build it, does it mean you didn't exist? Of course you did exist. In fact, you are the one building the, 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 the factory. I hope many of you will do that one day. Okay, so you designate one particular area as, as your office, as your throne, okay? Where you rule from, where you direct things from. And that's exactly what God did, okay? So God created the heavens and the earth, okay, and he, designated the heaven, one part of heaven, as we have seen, there are different layers of heaven, okay? And he designated it as his throne from where he directs, you know, all the angels, where he directs uh, the affairs of, 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 of uh, his whole creation, or even of mankind, where he, you know, sends uh, angels from and the spirits of God from, but that does not mean that God lives there permanently. Okay, just like somebody who has an office in a factory or in a, in a company does not sleep there, okay? At least it's not normal, okay? Some people do it, but it's not normal. But once you're finished your work for the day, you go home, okay? You go to relax, you go to replenish yourself. And that's what we human beings have to do. Now, with God, he is... He is eternal. And the Bible tells us that he is far beyond the highest heaven, okay? The highest heaven cannot contain him because he is God. He has created all things. Okay, so God has designated uh, a place called heaven as his throne. But he doesn't need that throne, so he uses it. And then he says, the earth is its footstool. Okay, what does the footstool mean? Okay, the footstool is where you put your legs, eh? uh, to make yourself more comfortable. But the footstool, in my opinion, uh, is the place where all the leg work has to be done. Okay, you are familiar with the, with, with the term leg work. Okay, that means they're running around, the things like that, you know, all, all the things that have to be uh, done in, 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 in everyday work, uh, that's what we call leg work. So interestingly, God says, the earth is my footstool. That's where all the activities are happening that he has designed to be completed in this creation. So once God has completed all that he wants to accomplish and achieve in uh, us, then it doesn't serve any purpose anymore, isn't it? Okay, uh, maybe if, you, if I take the picture of a, of a factory or of a company, I mean, there are very few people who are turn, uh, raising their companies down, but some people do. You know, if your place has become too small, you raise it down and you build something bigger, bigger isn't it? In fact, that has very often happened in the last, in the last, uh, you know, maybe 20, 30 years, 40 years, or in, in, in my lifetime, in many of these uh, fast-growing companies, okay? I hope we see it soon happening in Zambia as well, you know, because some of the places where we are manufacturing things are, are just too tiny, are just too small, you know? We are supposed to have bigger and bigger facilities. You know, Amazon, I'm sure you're all familiar with Amazon, Amazon.com, you know, you can go and buy anything you want. Uh, they started in a, in a small warehouse, okay? That's where they brought books together and they sent it to people who wanted to buy. And it was a very small business. Today, Amazon is a huge business, one of the biggest businesses, creating amazing amounts of, 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 of revenue. And of course, with, with the growing business, the infrastructure had to grow as well, okay? 
So today they have offices and warehouses in many different places all over the world. Okay, so what you have today, thank God for it, but we pray and hope that you are going to grow so that you raise everything down and build a bigger thing, you know. Not without God, okay. Remember that man who said, oh, my bands are full and uh, I, I, I can't store it anymore, so let me build bigger things so that I, so that I can enjoy everything for the rest of my life. Uh, you know, he did it without God. But uh, we must understand, God operates in that way also, okay? And we should operate with God, not, not independent of God, but with God. So when God has given you a blessing and you enjoy this blessing, uh, you should grow beyond that blessing of yesterday. Remember the people of Israel, they were given the ability to collect uh, manna every single day. And every new day that came, they had to leave the old stuff behind. That's a lesson that we have to learn because very often we are getting stuck with things that God had given to us some time ago. You know, we, we, are, we are, you know, bogged down to a small dimension and we are not ready for something greater, for something bigger that God wants to do in our lives. So that's a challenge, okay? So if God says one day the current heaven and the current earth will be no longer sufficient to do his work and he will do away and he will create a new heaven and new earth, you know, it should, it should inspire us to think about where we are at the moment and maybe we should also move forwards because maybe we have been where we are for too long. Okay, one day, you know, God said to the people of Israel, you know, where you have been, you have been for too long. Get up and move again. That was to enter into the promised land. So maybe where you have been for some time now, maybe you have been too, for too long, and you need to allow God to lead you into a greater dimension that he has prepared for you. That's just besides, the, uh, the, just along the way. Okay? Now, earth is God's school. Okay? It's God's university. It's God's examination center. That's where everything that he wants to do in our life needs to be tested, okay? Everything that God does in the life of human beings needs to be, you know, built in this earth, needs to be tested in this earth. As we know very well, you know, you can have grand ideas, you put it on a piece of paper, and you think it will work. But you will only know whether it works when you put it into reality, when you are building that thing which is on your piece of paper and then test it, whether it can really be able to accomplish the thing. You know, uh, like in the history of mankind, we have uh, seen a lot of uh, papers being found, you know, like uh, Leonardo, Leonardo da Vinci, for instance, was a, was a genius. And he has a lot of, he did a lot of drawings and some of them he put into practice, uh, and some of them worked, but others did not work. Okay? He had ideas about flying machines. He had ideas about all kinds of different things. But, you know, having this on, on a piece of paper is not sufficient. You need to put it into reality, and they test it. Is it going to work? That's the same that is true for us in a spiritual dimension. You know, God is building our lives. And we should not just say, okay, I have understood it theoretically, okay? Now, of course, we must understand, and that's why we must listen to your word, and that's why the Bible says that God uh, loves the people who tremble at his word. That's where he wants to be, okay? Uh, he says, I look, on favor with, uh, uh, I look on with favor to those who humble, uh, with a humble and contrite spirit, and who tremble at my words. That's why God loves to be, because these are the people he can utilize uh, to expand, you know, to be challenged for greater things. And so God wants to work in every single one of us. So God takes us through a process, and all of us have gone through that process. Not maybe all of it, but, you know, we are all sufficiently old enough 
that we have gone through preschool maybe, okay, or kindergarten, then we have gone to primary school at least. And when we graduated from primary, we went to high school, secondary, or whatever you call it. Then we went to college, we went to university, or we went to, uh, you know, vocational training, or whatever it is, you know. You are graduating from one level of expertise to a higher level of expertise. Okay? You're not stuck. We're not stagnant. And God wants us to be clear that we must be able to move forward with our lives. That's very important. So this is where the leg work happens on us, where God has his footstool, okay? where, where everything has to move, where things have to be developed and have to be tested. That's why we are here. You see, that's why God created earth as a place which God could give us in order to test our ability to rule, okay? To test our ability to take charge of creation, our ability to direct the lives, you know, first it was animals or our family or, or whatever it is that God gives to us. That is the purpose of us. Okay, where everything has to be tested that God has given to us or that God is developing inside of our lives. But then, of course, we know when you are in primary school, you're always looking forward to the, guy, the guys in the, in the, higher, in the higher up uh, hierarchy, isn't it? I remember when I, when I did not go to school, I was going to to kindergarten and my brother went to school who was one and a half years older I, I, I couldn't wait for the day to join him in school okay and that's natural when you're finally in school you know you want to graduate to the next higher level okay whether it's you know primary secondary university college or whatever it is, we, we always look forward to go beyond that. There wouldn't be a purpose for us to go to school for good unless you're a teacher. But as a student, you have to learn your stuff and move on. Am I right? You're only allowed to remain in school if you are teaching the, the ones who are coming. But otherwise, you have to go to the next higher level. Now, the next higher level for us here on this earth is that we need to keep our mind open for the things that are yet to come in the future that God is talking about. We are looking forward to the home of righteousness, a new heaven and a new earth. Okay? Amazing. Now, Along the way, of course, this reminds us that this world cannot be our permanent home. Why not? Have you ever seen somebody who is 3,000 years old, or 2,000 years old, or 1,500 years old, or, or 500 years old, or 300 years old, by, for, for that matter? Have you any, any, anyone has seen somebody like that? You know, it's even rare to find people who are 100 years old. Do you know anybody who is 100 years old? Raise your hand. Sorry. Even me. Only from the newspaper I read sometimes. This one is now the oldest man. He's 116 years old, but he's somewhere in Japan or somewhere in, in a far place, you know? This, is, uh, this one died, so now this one is the oldest person or the oldest woman or the oldest man. You know, uh, but personally, I, I don't know them. The other day I was watching an interview uh, of, a, of a certain gentleman who was quite prominent at one time, you know, after the Second World War, he was involved in the Nuremberg uh, uh, um, uh, court uh, proceedings. And, uh, of course, when you saw the man, you could see he's quite old. But uh, he was very strong. He was very effective. You know, he was uh, communicating in an amazing way. And so along the way, he says... <clears throat> Anyway, 
I'm, I'm just old. After all, I'm, I'm 104 years now. And I, I almost couldn't believe it, you know, because he was looking so fresh, so uh, energetic. So, are you planning to be 104? Or 110? Or 120? <laughs> okay. In fact, uh, the last level that God has uh, put is uh, 120 years. So actually, theoretically, we could get 120 years old. Uh, only the reality is that you can live in your life 70 or 80 years if you have the strength. Okay, so the strength is what determines how old you can really get at the end of the day. Okay, so the reality is that life on this planet Earth <clears throat> has limits. And we are reminded about that every now and then. Okay? Every now and then we are saying farewell to somebody, we come together, we have a, a funeral service, we have a body viewing, we see somebody uh, that we have been interacting with, that we have loved, that we have been having times of uh, uh, joy and, and, and all kinds of different uh, experiences. And then, of course, all of a sudden, you see this person lifeless. You say farewell. But you say farewell only to the body because the life that was inside of that person is, is already gone. Okay, so that reminds us that life on this earth, on this planet, is not for good. It is just a pilgrimage, as the Bible tells us. It's a, it's a passage of time that God has given to us in order to accomplish that which God wants to see being done in each and every one of us, okay? That purpose, according to his plan, needs to be finished in our lives. And of course, some people never finish that. That means they are going prematurely. That should not happen to us who love the Lord and walk with him. So now, we must understand that one day, just like we are graduating from school or university, one day we are graduating from this earth. Okay? This earth is not for good. It is just a certain, fulfilling a certain purpose in our life and then we, we have to leave. Okay? The origin of righteousness is God himself. So that means if we go to the home of righteousness, that means we go to God. Okay? That is our destiny. You know, don't worry about what kind of uh, secondary structure there is, you know. Many people, they are talking about going to heaven, and that, that may be a nice and good thought. But in the, at the end of the day, you are not, not called to be in a place. You are called to be with God. Because the home of righteousness is God himself. Okay, he is the originator of righteousness and justice. Like we have seen here, he will fill Zion with justice and righteousness. Okay? So that's our destiny. God is our destiny. In the book of Ezekiel, we have a very powerful uh, illustration, a very powerful picture that the, the prophet Ezekiel is is vividly drawing for us in uh, the book of Ezekiel chapter 47. And the Bible says that there is, a, there is a water flowing from the altar of God, you know, from the temple. And it's just a small client kind of flow, like a, like a well, you know, that flows. Like some busy river, if you go to Minilunga, you don't see a mighty river there. You just see a flow that begins the process of that river. And then Ezekiel describes that as he goes down that, that uh, flow of water, he comes to a place where, where the water will rise and it will go to ankle deep. Okay? Then it goes to knee deep. Then it goes to your waist. Then it goes to your neck. And eventually you can't touch the ground. You have to swim. Okay? And that's exactly a picture of what God is going to do. So, in other words, we are going to enter a sphere that is no longer, you know, based on the ground, but it is based on the righteousness of God. Okay? And God is working things out for us 
in this very powerful way. So God will inhabit his new creation where we will be with him forever. Now, now you see, this is why when you are saying I'm going to heaven, uh, the question is which heaven are you planning to go to? Okay, because the current heaven will pass away. Okay, let me just read that for you, just in case you are not aware of it. Second Peter chapter 3, verse 8. Very powerful. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years. Okay, so we can see already that there is a big discrepancy between our time and God's time between his thoughts and our thoughts. Okay? So with the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish. Okay? Interesting, isn't it? Everyone who is going to be born must have an opportunity to come to that point in his or her life where he or she can decide to walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. Where we can be built and strengthened for the purpose for which God has actually created us. So God is patient. He doesn't want anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord, and that's a very interesting term, the day of the Lord. Actually, there are other scriptures that talk about the day of the Lord, and one day maybe we take a study in that. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. Okay? You don't know when a thief is coming, isn't it? If you knew when the thief is coming to your house, you, you would be ready for him. You know, you, everything would be well prepared to have him locked up straight away. But they are, the, the thing is, you don't know. Okay, so there is a time when God, you know, declares the day of the Lord. And when the day of the Lord comes, it comes at a time that we cannot, that we cannot understand. And the Bible says, on that day of the Lord, the heavens, okay, heavens in plural, isn't it? The heavens will disappear with a roar. The elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything in it will be laid bare. Okay? They will be laid bare. According to what I understand here is that the, the, the earth itself will still be there, but it will be bare. Okay? Almost like uh, when the first uh, creation happened, you know, the Bible tells us that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. And then the next verse says, and there was void, there was darkness, everything was empty. And that's what seems to be coming again. Okay, everything will be laid bare. Since everything will be destroyed in this way, what kind of people ought you to be? You ought to be, you ought to live holy and godly lives as you look forward to the day of God and speed its coming. Interestingly, we have an influence of how quickly the day of the Lord is going to arrive. Okay? If we are finishing with our, with our examination, okay, I'm, I'm sure you have been sitting in examination and, you know, you get a number of questions and maybe you get a, a, a bonus question in case you have not uh, been very good on another one. But if you have finished everything and you still have 30 minutes on your clock, does it mean you have to sit there for the 30 minutes? Okay. Actually, you pack your things and you go because you have done what needs to be done. You have been finishing your examination. Okay. And that's what uh, scripture tells us, that we have an influence of speeding the day of the Lord. Okay. Now, that's very complex. It does not have something to do with just one individual. Actually, it's the church which needs to become ready for the Lord. Okay. For his day. That day will bring about the destructions of the heavens by fire and the elements will melt in the hills. 
But in keeping with this promise, we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth, the home of righteousness. So then, dear friends, since you are looking forward to this, make every effort to be found spotless, blameless, and at peace with him. So in other words, you know, when the test is over, you know, when the day of the Lord will come, we need to be the kind of people that God wanted us to become in the first place. Okay? We need to be spotless. We need to have dealt with our temptations in life. We need to have overcome uh, the many, many challenges that we are all facing in this world. Okay? We need to have sat for our examination and finished it. Then the day will come. Okay? Now, nobody knows the day, and I'm not going to speculate about that, but the fact is that the day of the Lord will come, and we will later on do some more study on this subject. So Jesus is busy working things out in our life every single day. Okay? And when finally the new creation comes, God is going to inhabit that creation where we will be with him forever. So the, 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 the importance is not on the new heaven or the old heaven, but the importance is on Christ. The importance is on our Father. Okay, the importance is that we are meeting as a family in a place that is adequately prepared for that purpose. Amazing, isn't it? Now, in scripture we are learning that Jesus is already elevated to that position. Okay, let me take you uh, to the book of Philippians chapter 2 and verse 6. And I'm sure you have all read that, you all know that scripture. The Bible says here, so he was God, that is Christ, okay? So he was God. He did not think of equality with God as something to cling to. Okay, he was willing to give up everything. Instead, he gave up his divine privilege, privileges and he took the humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. When he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on a cross. Therefore, now listen, therefore. Now God did all of that because of us, because of you and me, okay? Because he gave his life as a sacrifice for our sin and our sin is forgiven because of what Christ did. Okay, and the Bible says, therefore, Okay, and the therefore always uh, refers back on, on what has been said before. Therefore, God elevated him to the place of highest honor. Highest honor. Hmm, it's amazing, isn't it? And he gave him a name above all other names. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So God is already, you know, uh, has already elevated Christ into the highest place. And this has nothing to do with, you know, a better place on earth or maybe, uh, you know, going from the first he heaven to the second heaven or the third heaven, but there is a highest place. Like we have read earlier on that, God is not living uh, in, in houses made by human hands, and even the highest heaven, you know, cannot contain him. So God lives in the place which is highest. We cannot understand that. That is beyond our, our uh, rational understanding. So we, we just have to accept it. And you know, in the book of Ephesians, uh, the scripture I read earlier on in uh, to, uh, as the introduction, we, we read that Paul is praying that we may have power together with all the saints to grasp the greater dimension of the love of God. Okay, how wide, how deep. And, and uh, if you read this very carefully, you'll find there, is, there are four dimensions here. How wide, how long, how high, and how deep the love of Christ is. Okay, so there are things beyond just a 
you know, our, for the lack of a better word, for a physical place like earth or for a spiritual place like heaven. But there is something which is in God himself, okay? And God wants us to, to learn about the love that flows forth from the threshold of God. You know, the righteousness and justice that comes from God. That highest place to which Christ has been elevated. Which everyone, you know, every knee must bow before him. Every tongue must confess. And that is not ex uh, exempting anyone. I think it's for, for creatures like us who are physical and I think it's for creatures like, like the angel worlds. Even, even the, uh, the number one enemy of, of God, Satan himself, has to bow before Christ. Okay? No question about it. That's amazing. Now, at present, this is beyond our comprehension. You know, creation, this present creation is already beyond our understanding. Because there are so many things that we have not yet discovered, that we have not yet understood. Okay? Even so, you know, scientists are studying, you know, 24-7, 365 days. Uh, days a year and they're making a lot of strides they're discovering a lot of things but even so they have discovered it's just scratching the surface because there's so much more so much more we can't understand because everything that has been made has been made by God you know uh, let me take you to the book of Exodus uh, this is a very powerful word, and I think we need to, we need to think through that t time and again. These are, this is part of the Ten Commandments. And when I read from Exodus chapter 20, verse 2, the Bible says, God speaking here, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. We could actually apply this to our own life, out of the sinful world that we have been in, out of the bondage of Satan, it is God who has released us. Then he says, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol in the form of anything in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the waters below. You shall not bow down to them and worship them for I the Lord your God I'm a jealous God, punishing the children for the sins of the fathers to the third and fourth generation to those who hate me. But showing love to a thousand generations of those who love me and keep my commandments. That's amazing. Now God says we should not make an image, neither from the things that we see on earth or the things that we are seeing in the, in the oceans or the things that are uh, in the heavens as far as we can even grasp that the reality is whatever we are going to make in order to you know trying to um, give room or give picture give uh, elements to God will be falling short of the reality and the nature of God and that's why God says you must never even do that you see this is the problem that we have we are trying to understand the spiritual dimensions with the human mind, okay? That's why you see people talking about experiences that they are claiming they had when they were going to heaven. I don't know where they went. Even themselves, they cannot tell you where they went. They cannot tell you their address, okay? And when they came back, they don't know how they came back. Yes, they may have seen things, but it may not necessarily have it. And you know, many of them describe things that are rather reflective of this, of this world than, you know, probably reflective of what, in, what heaven is all about. So in other words, what God says to us, you cannot make an image of the living God. Neither should you make an image of that which God is going to do in the, in the, in the uh, eternity to come. Because it will always fall short. That's why we must be careful with trying to, you know, make some structure and saying, 
this is how God needs to move or in this structure God is going to move. No, God is beyond that. Okay, heaven is his throne, earth is his footstool. And that is for the current heaven and for the current earth. What will be, you know, reality in the new heaven and the new earth, we have only got glimpses out of scripture. And we need to allow ourselves to just tremble at the word of God, learn from the word of God, be open to new ideas from scripture, not from science fiction, but from scripture. Okay, because in the word of God, there is so much that we are not yet able to understand, that we are not able to comprehend as yet. You know, as I said, scientists have researched and researched and researched, and yet there are many things we don't know. You know, when we look at history, for instance, we don't know how the old Egyptians were building the pyramids. No clue. They're trying to find out. We have got some ideas, maybe this way, maybe that way. They didn't have heavy construction machines like we have today. How did they manage to build these massive pyramids? and put these stones on top of each other until finally it rose to that level where it is today. You know, these are monuments of the past that tell us our understanding, our, limi- our, our, our knowledge is very, very limited. We know that archaeologists, they are digging the ground and every time they are finding something, they say, oh, we have got a solution. Now, this is how it works. Maybe 20, 30, 50 years later, they find another thing, another, another uh, fossil, and they bring it together and they say, ah, no, I think this doesn't work. Our, our, our idea, our theory, that is, is, is actually uh, destined for the rubbish pit, you know, because it's no longer working. Actually, if you go back in history, if you go back in science, you find so many things that have been done away with because they are giving us just just certain insights, but not a complete picture. And so we don't understand our history, much less we do even understand the future. You know, just think about the macrocosm, you know, the end of the universe we don't understand. Or even the microcosm, that means all the little things inside of our body or inside of this world, you know, the, the molecules, the atoms, the nuclear fusion that we have been able to to create. And and we know that nuclear power is so amazingly powerful, but there is so much more which we have not understood. Okay? We don't know. So if we don't understand this creation in which we are presently live, how much less do we understand the new creation that God is going to, to bring about? Okay? God says... I will make a new heaven and a new earth. Let me, let me uh, remind you, you know, this was prophesied by Isaiah. It was repeated by uh, the apostle Peter. And it was now, and it's confirmed in the book of Revelation. And in Revelation chapter 21 verse 1, the Bible says, Then I saw. Okay, that which was promised by the prophet. That which was talked about by by uh, um, Peter, finally it was coming into being when John was able to go ahead of us in time to see the new things that God created. And the Bible says, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. Okay? Now, Maybe we cannot really fully understand that, okay? Because water is so important for all of us. And if you read further in the very same uh, chapter or up to the end of the book of Revelation, you're actually seeing a river flowing. And if there is no sea, where is the river flowing to? Okay? So there are a lot of question marks. But of course, what we must understand is this is not necessarily talking about physical things. This is talking about spiritual realities. Okay, so God showed John the new heaven and the new earth. And then he says, I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. The new Jerusalem. Okay, 
I would say this is the home of righteousness. Okay, this is the home that God himself is preparing. It, it doesn't come from earth, you know, like the temple was built from the ground and then they say, okay, God, God come and uh, inhabit this, this, this place. And of course, Solomon had to realize, no, he, will, he cannot live here. He, he, he may establish his glory here, but he cannot permanently live here. But then the Bible tells us, when finally the new Jerusalem is coming into being, you know, down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them. Praise God. You see, this is our destiny. Not, not some kind of heaven that we don't understand. Okay? You know, if you're hearing stories about heaven, okay, if you are interested, read it, but, but please, don't get influenced by these things. Because even if they would have seen the heaven that is there today, that heaven will disappear. And no one has seen the new heaven except what John describes to us here. So the ultimate aim is for us to be living with our God. The dwelling of God is with men. Already today, as we have read in the book of Isaiah chapter 66, God lives in a contrite heart. Okay? In a humble attitude. God will establish himself. And God wants to be with his creation. In fact, that's why, you know, he has created us in the first place. He created us to be his family. He created us to be with him forever and ever. In such a close relationship that God talks about like a husband and a wife. Okay? That's the, the, the destiny of God for all of us. And we must not forget that some of these things, we can't catch them now. We can only read them, hear them, and accept them by faith. We cannot understand it. Isaiah chapter 55, verse 8 says, My thoughts are nothing like your thoughts. Okay? We have thoughts, and of course... Uh, Every human being has a ceiling somewhere. And of course, there are others who may be able to have thoughts much deeper than yours. Okay, we must accept that. There are different types of people in our world. And thank God for all the thoughts that people can be able to develop, but they can never reach the thoughts of God. And so God is saying, my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts, says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything you could imagine. Okay, For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways, and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. Isn't that powerful? So really, our destiny is not a place. Our destiny is God. Our destiny is with our Father and with our Lord Jesus Christ in the Spirit of the Lord. Okay, that's our destiny. That's what it's all about. So the dimension in which God moves are mind-boggling. You have heard us reading that one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years is like one day. That, now we can't understand that. You know, God doesn't even say, you know, uh, one day is like ten years. Okay, that we could maybe still comprehend. But even when it would, if it would be hundred, that's already be too much for us because we don't get that so old. But then he says a thousand years is like one day, or one day is like a thousand years. Which means this is out of our frame. Okay? We can't get that. And yet that's what God is all about. So we should never allow ourselves to be, to be depressed, to be fearful, to be, uh, you know, uh, in a mood of panic. Because God is in control. Okay? And the Bible has said it very clearly that he wants everyone to be with him, okay? Every one of us is called to be in the home of righteousness, where God dwells, where we are going to be united with him, our creator, 
the one who has loved us with an everlasting love and the one who has a future for us which we do not understand. Okay? Amazing. So for today, I want to just encourage you to look into the scriptures in a different way. You know, there was a scripture, I just want to uh, refer to it in the book of Second Samuel, uh, chapter 16, verse 7, where Samuel went to the house of Jesse. Okay, Jesse was uh, the head of that family, and he had uh, a number of sons, and uh, God told Samuel, go and uh, anoint the new king of Israel from the sons of Jesse. But he didn't tell him who. And so, when Samuel came to the house of uh, I mean, when, when, when the prophet Samuel came to the house of Jesse, he said, okay, where are your sons? And he lined them all up and he went down there and he saw these guys, you know, powerful, you know, young, energetic. And he thought by himself, this is the one. Okay? And God spoke to him. And he said something very important. You know, when... when uh, Sometimes you see things from the outside, don't make your final judgment. Because it may be wrong, it may be a wrong judgment. And God said to Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 16 verse 7, But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at their hearts. Okay? Now our natural eyes cannot see their hearts. Okay? But if you know somebody, you can take the temperature of somebody's life. Okay? And you know, this is what we must take to heart. We can't see all the spiritual realities that God is actually preparing for right now. Okay, just like Samuel could see the young man and he thought, hey, this is it. And so sometimes you hear people saying, oh, I've seen heaven, I've seen this, I've seen that, I've, I've insight. Be careful. Because God may say, what you are seeing is just from the natural point of view. But I'm not looking at it from the natural point of view. I look deeper. I look at the spiritual realities in this world. And so let us remember that God is busy working things out. So we are waiting for the day of the Lord. That is definitely going to come. We don't know whether it will be in our lifetime, whether it will be in the lifetime of the next generation or in 10 generations or in 20 generations. We don't know. All of this is unknown to us. But whatever happens, we should prepare ourselves for that day. And this is what Paul is saying, you know, make sure that you are the kind of people that God wants you to be. He wants you to live holy and godly lives. That's the challenge. Because even if the day of the Lord will come in a, a several generations of uh, uh, this world, when we are long gone, we are going much earlier. Okay, and we still have to meet with our God. We still are going to be united with him forever and ever, and we need to be ready for that day. So may the Lord bless you. As I said in the beginning, this is a lot of stuff that I have given you, a lot of information. Please read the scriptures. I can't possibly uh, go into uh, big details in every little uh, area, but you know, God has prepared a home of righteousness for all of us. And that home of righteousness is where God is. Because he is the source of righteousness. He is the source of justice. And our future will be with him. You know, some people take heaven as an insurance policy. Okay? Maybe they have, uh, uh, you know, raised their hand at one time and says, I also want to follow Jesus. And then they do their own thing. No, that is not what, what it's all about. Okay? Heaven is not an endurance policy. No, heaven means that you must know Christ, your Savior and Lord, and live according to his nature, holy and righteous. Amen?
Because if we live a righteous life, then the home of righteousness is not going to be strange to us. If you are coming as an unrighteous person into the home of righteousness, you cannot stay there. You cannot live there. You cannot feel comfortable there. It will be, it will be a torture for you to be there. That's why you know, people are just saying, oh, no, I want to go to heaven, but meanwhile I want to live like a devil. It's not going to work. Because even if you would be taken there, it would expel you straight away. You know, because you can't stand the righteousness of God. So we have to wait, get used to live a holy and righteous life here on earth. You know, that's why God is taking us through the different lessons, the different examinations, the different schools that we are going through in order to have us ready for the home of righteousness. May God bless you. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you. We thank you for the revelation that flows from your word in such a powerful way. Lord, I pray that what we have heard may not just be uh, a sound that we cannot make anything out of, but Lord, let it become a reality inside of our hearts, inside of our lives. Let it become that wonderful lifestyle that you want us to live. Lord Jesus, you have called us to be compatible with you. And only when we are beginning to learn compatibility with you here on earth can we be able to find our room and our space in the home of righteousness where you are waiting for us to be united with you, united as the family of God, the eternal family of God. Lord, we are longing for that day. We are excited about what you're going to do. And Lord, we pray, let your grace be poured out upon each and every one of us. Let your love be manifested in your heart in all the dimensions that you have spoken about. So that, Lord, we really become transformed, changed, and compatible with the home of righteousness. To you be the glory. We give you honor. And we say, Amen. Amen. Well, uh, we have just decided last week that we are doing a 